So um, I don't know how long I'll be able to go today as far as sermon-wise, but um, uh, the joke has been made a few times by church members. It's like, you know, the reason we start worship at 1030 in this congregation is so we can get to the restaurants before the Methodists do. You might even get to the restaurant way before the Methodists do today. So, yeah. But uh, trust me, trust me. Um, one of my things that I, I love doing with groups, uh, I've done it with youth groups, and I've done it when I was a, a graduate resident director at a dorm at Gardner-Webb, this thing called the trust fall. You know what the trust fall is? Oh, it's fun. It can be fun. It can be entertaining, too. But a trust fall, essentially, you have somebody, let's say me, and you stand up higher than the other people, another crowd, and you stand and you fall backwards, and hopefully the people standing, like, say, here would catch you in their arms. It's a trust fall. You trust that they're going to catch you. One of the things I like to do with youth groups and like to do when I was over at Dormant Gardner Webb with college-age kids was, you know, have somebody stand up there ready to fall and, and kind of have something planned out. The catchers say, hey, act like you're going to catch them and all of a sudden pull your arms back. And, of course, we'd have pillows down or something to catch the person so they wouldn't get totally hurt. But uh, it was just a, a brief reminder in the, in the life of the person falling back that, we can trust all we want in people, but sometimes people let us down, don't they? You know, we live in a world where people fail us all the time. You can trust all you want that somebody's going to do the right thing, going to be there like they said they were. They're going to uh, help you like they said they were going to, but they let you down. And I want us to think about today this passage in Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, Five, uh, 17, 5 through 10, and let's think about trusting in human resources, trusting in divine resources, and also think about why we shouldn't necessarily put all of our trust in human resources. So let's look at the passage today. Let's talk, start talking about trusting in human resources and look at the first uh, two verses of our passage today in Jeremiah, and I'm using the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible. This is what the Lord says. The man who trusts in mankind, who makes human flesh his strength and turns his heart from the Lord, is cursed. Okay? So almost from the bat, like almost like Psalm 1, we have this contrast set up, the way of the wicked, the way of the righteous. He will be like a juniper in Arabah, and he cannot see when good comes, but dwells in the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one lives. So we find that this person who trusts in human resources, humankind, mankind, in this passage is compared to a bush that's in a dry, desolate, deserted desert place, salted land, or salt land, where no one lives. The resources are limited. The resources are meager, if any, and you think uh, most vegetation do not thrive in resource where resources are slim. You think of a lush uh, rainforest where plants abound. And then you think about a desert where cacti and other brush, they struggle and strive for existence. It's hard. It's easier when resources are plentiful. It's easier when things are there for you. But a person who trusts in human beings, well, <laughs> resources aren't always there. You see, we as human beings, we often trust in things we shouldn't trust in. We put all our faith in things we shouldn't put our faith in. And I just kind of made a list, brainstorming of some of the things that I've put my trust in, I probably shouldn't have, money and wealth. A lot of people uh, put a lot of trust in money. You know, whether you realize it or not, uh, my wife and I, we have a little bit of trust in money. We have retirement plans, 401Ks and things like that, 403CBs or whatever. The 403B, excuse me, is the retirement through Guidestone. And all these different retirement plans, we trust that that money is not going to decline too greatly in the stock market and we'll have some money when we retire. A lot of people uh, do, do live life, though, like they think that a hearse has a trailer hitch. You, you ever heard that? A hearse with a trailer hitch? I don't, I've never seen any hearses with trailer hitches, but there are people that live like that. They amass money. They put so much faith in this money, this bulk of money, they act like they're going to take it with them. But last time I checked, you can't take it with you, can you? There's no magical Star Trek uh, tractor beam or, you know, transporter device to take all of our riches to glory with us. In fact, I don't know if there's anything you could do with riches and glory anyway. 
But we put our trust oftentimes in money and wealth and, and possessions and things. Some people put their trust in power and control, leadership. I'm the boss. I'm going to do well. I, since I have power, since I have control, you know, I can't do any wrong. There's some people that put their knowledge or put, me, put their uh, trust and faith in wits and knowledge. Well, I know better than so-and-so. Or I even, some people even dare to say, I know better than God himself. I'm an intelligent, rational human being of a scientific age. Why should I believe in some fairy tale or mythology of some God who's distant? And this, this fairy tale book called the Bible, why should I believe it? It's, there's nothing scientific or rational about it. A lot of people put their trust in wits and knowledge. A lot of people put their trust in institutions. But institutions fail, don't they? Sometimes businesses fail. Businesses like, you know, the, the great and mighty Sears and Roebuck Company. I mean, I used to remember as a kid, we'd get the J.C. Penny catalog around Christmas time. We'd get the Sears catalog. And Mama would give me a pen or a marker, and I'd sit down, and I'd make my Christmas list off those catalogs. Well, every time I turn on the news or go on the Internet, it looks like Sears is about ready to fold. Here recently, they had to sell off themselves to a, to a, a new company uh, uh, run by their current CEO. But that's, most uh, economists uh, I've read say that pretty much that's just a, uh, a temporary fix. Here sometime soon, Sears will fold. Could you imagine the great and mighty Sears folding? Doesn't seem possible. But institutions fold. Sadly, even some Christian institutions fail. Some churches close. Sad thing these days. Some people put their, their faith and their trust in institutions and knowledge and wits and money and wealth, power. And even some people put their trust in, in, in institutions that, like military, that almost don't always help. You see, Israel, there's several passages in the Bible that remind us that we could put our trust in all kind of different things, but really, essentially God is the only place we should put our trust. Psalms 28, 7 through 8, and I love this because it reminds us that no matter how strong we think we are as people, no matter how much military might Israel thought they had, God was ultimately the source of their power. Psalm 20, verses 7 through 8. Some people trust in chariots, others in horses, but we praise the Lord's name. They will collapse and fall, but we will stand up straight and strong. No matter how big we think we are, no matter how much trust we place in ourselves or institutions that are supposed to support us, like for Israel's example, their military, institutions fail. We fail and falter. We humans are imperfect. Isaiah 31, one, 31 verse 1 says, Doomed to those going down to Egypt for help. They rely on horses, trust in chariots, because they are many. On riders, because they are strong. But they don't look to the Holy One of Israel. They don't seek the Lord. Or Psalm 118, 9. It is far better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in any human leader. CEOs fail us. Presidents fail us. Ministers fail us. There's two major mega churches in the Chicago area um, who recently their pastors have had to resign over issues of uh, questions of their sexual uh, proclivities and, and incidences. Pastors fail. Institutions fail, but God stays strong. You see, we don't need to trust in human resources because the things of man fail. We need to trust in divine resources, the great and mighty God. Jeremiah goes on to write, The man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence indeed is in the Lord, or excuse me, is the Lord, is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water it seeds uh, excuse me it sends its roots out toward a stream it doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green 
It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. So again, this contrast is drawn between a, a desert plant and a dry, barren, salted land, struggling for survival in the midst of uncertainty. That's, that's tr- trusting humanity or human d- resources. But the other picture given, this metaphor of, of lush plants with deep roots near a stream that can withstand a little bit of drought or withstand ceasing producing fruit, this is a picture of one who trusts in God. You see, it's almost like what type of battery you're tapping into, say a battery in your car, a battery in some sort of device or whatever. Um, if the battery is about dead, you ain't going to get much out of it. When you tap into the, to the, our own resources, as human resources, there's not much strength to, to, be, to glean, be gleaned there, to be garnered there. But when you tap into God, the ultimate power source of all of humanity, the ultimate power source in the universe and all of eternity, we have a great resource to tap into. You see, when life fails, when life falters, when we falter and we fail, other humans may fall by the wayside. The things of this world we put our trust in falter, but God stands firm. The ultimate and mighty God, the God who did not give up on Israel. Now think about back to the Old Testament, all the things that Israel did to disobey God he didn't give up on him. Even if it had narrowed down from the Old Testament down to the book of, say, Judges, a little bit of a microcosm. There's almost like a broken record cycle of their, the, Israel's obedient to God. God sends a deliverer to, to rescue them from this, this uh, uh, oppressor because of, God sent because of their wickedness. And then, you know, the whole cycle starts over again. In other words, there's a broken record of uh, disobedience, uh, punishment, uh, obedience to God, reliance on God, God delivering, and going back, it's all over and over. All the sins that they amassed, God was still faithful to them. God was still there for them, a great resource for them. You see, the problem is with trusting in human beings is that, that we have a broken human heart. Jeremiah points to that in verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? We've got rotten hearts. We've got rotten hearts, people. Human, the human nature, the flesh and nature that Paul talks about, the, maybe it's uh, something of a, the Augustan notion of original sin, I don't know, but something inside of us is a little bit rotten to the core. Jeremiah points to that. I, Yahweh, examine the mind. I test the heart to give each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. You see, humans have a heart of darkness. One of my favorite books in high school, and I, and I turn to it every now and then, I hadn't read it in a while, though I need to go back and read it again, was Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. <laughs> Jandra shaking her head. She hated that book. <laughs> I, I like miserable stuff. What can I say? But it, to give you the, 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 the cliff notes, on the cliff notes of Heart of Darkness, it's a story set in uh, colonial Africa, and there's a soldier sent out to find this uh, missing military leader who's, who's just gone missing. He set up some sort of camp somewhere. But it, essentially what Conrad is doing, it's a study of human nature, uh, almost like maybe like the Lord of the Flies, if you will, is that when, whenever humanity is left to their own devices without rules, without supervision, what does humanity do? Is, is humanity innately dark and wicked? Some would argue even that uh, Admiral Kurtz, this, this man who's gone off to do his own thing, was wicked. But some would also argue that the colonial powers that are visited uh, at first, the first story where people are starving, that's the wicked part too. You know, Lord of the Flies, we have these children who are crash on this island and they set up their own little government scheme, but the, the evil and wickedness comes out of them. You see, while these literary novels not necessarily pulling from the Bible, we do see... In the text of Isaiah, as well as Romans 3.23, we see that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Paul's writings, he also talks about this notion of wrestling with the flesh, wrestling with this human nature that, that pulls us one way. I liken it almost to the old Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, with the devil on one side and the angel on the other side. We have an inner turmoil and struggle. But without Jesus... 
without God in our life, no matter how good we think we are, we have darkness in our heart. We have sin knocking on its door. Call it the devil, devil whispering in our ear. So that's why we can't trust in other people as fully as we could trust in God. Because human resources are limited, first off, but also because we're not as pure and reliable and faithful as God is. Humans will let you down every time. We have a wickedness and evilness about us that lead us astray. You see, but the solution to all this is, is trusting in God. And the solution for us, our individual selves, is that we need a new heart. You know, one of the beautiful images woven throughout the prophets, especially Ezekiel, as I mentioned here in Jeremiah, and even Deuteronomy 36 is this notion that the Israelites around the time of the exile, their hearts had, were, were, were wicked. Their hearts were stoned to some degree. Their hearts needed uh, they need a new heart. Maybe their, their rote actions were good. Maybe the rituals that they, they, they participated in were good. But their hearts were far from God. They needed a new heart. A heart that only God could give. In fact, the New Testament picks up on this a little bit. In John chapter 3, that's amidst the story of Nicodemus where Nicodemus, this religious leader, comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, you must be born again. How can I go back into my mother's womb, essentially? But no, you must be born again. This notion of a new heart, getting rid of the darkness, the sin that so knocks on the door that to tries to, to burrow into our heart and, and, and live and invade every aspect of our being. We need a new heart that comes from God, a heart that is filled with God and His love and His mercy. And his trust. We need a heart for God. We need to live by faith in God himself. You see, in this uncertain world, we need faith. We need faith. Now, even, even the most staunch of atheists and agnostics have faith. You ever thought about that? I found a really cute uh, illustration, Herschel Hobbes, his book on illustrations, he made this point. He says, a husband eats food cooked by his wife without having tested it to see if it contains poison. Why? Now, there are some of you husbands whose wives may have been tempted a time or two to poison them. Luckily, I do most of the cooking in my house. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have, we have faith that the other person cooking for us isn't trying to poison us. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but yes, we, I mean, we do have a little bit of faith there, don't we? Why does a man have faith in his wife as a poison? Because he has faith in his wife that she will not try to poison him. You know, and we also have faith. We accept paper money as legal tender because we have faith in our country's monetary system. These are two examples of living by faith. Now, the dollar ain't as strong as it used to be, but still, it has some value to it, even though it's just paper money. It's... Well, paper and, and, cloth, and cotton. But still, it doesn't mean much. I don't have a lot in my wallet. But this dollar will get me something, even though it's just paper. Because somebody has faith behind this fiat system that it's worth something. You see, so many people become agnostics when it's concerned to God because they find this notion of faith strange and crazy. Why trust in something, someone that we can't see, that we can't feel, that we can't touch? Why trust? We trust in money. We trust that people aren't trying to poison us. Most of, most sane individuals do. I should preface that. Most sane individuals do. There's some people out there with bad paranoia and different ailments that cause them to think things. But most people trust. Why can't we just trust in God? Now, a lot of people, a lot of these agnostics and atheists, uh, you know, these other people, and, and there's even some people who have fallen away from the faith, want something tangible to touch, to taste, to feel. They want to be that doubting Thomas, if I could just stick my fingers in his side. But you know what? I trust in God and the proofs in the pudding. Because I know what God has done in my life, what he 
has done to support me, to carry me through the hard times, and what he continues to do until I see glory. You see, we can trust in humanity all we want. We can trust in human institutions all we want. We can trust in humanity's stuff, the money, the wealth, the, the, the possessions, all we want. But it doesn't do us a lick of good if we don't trust in God supremely and ultimately. If we don't trust in his mercy and his righteousness and allow him to change our hearts and give us a new heart, a heart that's not filled with darkness, but a heart that's filled with light. We must trust in God. You know, maybe one of these days, uh, <laughs> maybe one of these days we'll have a, a trust fall event at this church. Maybe I'll get some of you people to volunteer. Maybe. Well, no, I've already given you all my secret, haven't I? I might let you fall. But you know who won't let you fall? God. No matter how low we may think we may get in life, God's still got our back. He's faithful and true. Some trust in chariots. But may we as God's people trust in him. As musicians come and as we sing, I encourage you to come forward if you'd like to pray, if you'd like to speak with me.